Most of you would agree that God is eternal. You know, he's not a mere mortal that he should die, that he should be subject to death. Death doesn't have power over God. So, you know, that's, that's a given. Most people believe that. But what a lot of people do not put much thought in, and that is that God is unchanging. Okay? God never has changed and never will change. In fact, at the end of the so-called Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, it says, I am the Lord, I change not. He confirmed, He ensured us, He never changes, never has, never will. But what you must understand is that the, the law of God, the law that God gives, the law that God gave reflects His character, okay? It says that the law is holy, just, and pure. That's because God is holy, just, and pure. It says the law of God is good. That is because God is good. So the law of God reflects the character of God. The law of God reflects the attributes of God. If it didn't, he would be a hypocrite, okay? God said, don't commit adultery. That's because he doesn't commit adultery. God says, don't covet. That's because he doesn't covet, and so on and so forth. So the law of God is holy, just, and good, and pure. That's because that is a, that is a reflection of God himself, okay? If God is eternal, then His law must be eternal. If God never changes, that means His law must never change. And that's something a lot, that a lot of people do not think about. In fact, it says very explicitly in the Scriptures that His law does not change and will not change. For example, in the book of Psalms 119 verse 89, it says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Okay? Now, when you think about this, now, when David sat down to write this, when he wrote down, you know, your word is forever settled in heaven, O God. Your, your word is forever settled in heaven. What was he thinking about? Back in those days, what was considered to be the word of God? Okay? Now, most scholars would, uh, would tell you that the book of Psalms wasn't even considered to be canonical scripture until hundreds of years after. Some say even as late as the second century AD. Okay? So the book of Psalms was basically just that, a book of songs. But when David said, your word is forever settled in heaven, what was he thinking about? What was considered to be the Word of God back in his day? Now, for those of you who know anything about the context of, this, of the Bible, or the context of Scripture, the context of the people of Israel, of the Jewish people, you would know that if anything is considered to be the Word of God, it would be the Torah, the books of Moses. Okay, And even today, even you know, Christians would tell you that the Bible is the Word of God, which includes the books of, books of Moses. So, if, I mean, if you, if you were to go to any, you know, uh, conservative evangelical Christian today and tell them, oh, by the way, you know what? Uh, the books of Moses is not the Word of God. I'm sure almost everybody would be up in arms saying, yes, it is the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. The books of Moses are part of the Bible. It is the Word of God. Exactly the Word of God. So if the Bible is the Word of God, and if the books of Moses, if they are the Word of God, then they are forever settled in heaven. Never have, the law of God has never been changed because God doesn't change. The law of God has never been done away with because God has never been done away with. The law of God, this is what you need to understand again, the law of God, it reflects the character and the attributes of God, okay? Now, David even went on further in uh, verse 152. He said, Concerning your testimonies, I have known of old 
you, that you have founded them forever. Now, the, the word testimonies here is, is, again, talking about the Word of God. You know, the whole book of Psalm, or the, the whole chapter of Psalm 119 is about uh, the law of God, the Word of God. You'll, you'll see it over and over again. The Word, the law, the statutes, the precepts, you know, the, uh, the testimonies, the judgments, okay? So it's just all just different words for speaking basically about the Word of God, the ways of God. So concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that you have founded them forever, it says in, in um, verse 152. Verse 160, it goes on again to say, the entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Okay? So, the law of God is part of the judgments and the testimonies and the word of God. It is forever settled in heaven. Forever. It has always been and always will be. In fact, you know, Yeshua, Jesus himself, said, I'm not here to, to, to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Now, I mean, he, you got to understand, again, the context, the culture. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. He was Jewish. He was a rabbi. What does it mean to a Jewish person to fulfill the law? What does it mean to fulfill um, a mitzvah, what they call a mitzvah, which is a commandment or the commandments, the mitzvot? What does it mean? It means to obey them. It doesn't mean to put, put it to an end or put a stop to it or bring it, bring it to a, you know, to wrap it up and, and, and just kind of put it, about, put it up on the shelf. It means to obey them. So when Jesus said, I'm not here to abolish it, but to fulfill it, he was saying, I'm here to, and this is what it says in um, the, the Greek lexicon, Thayer's Greek, Greek lexicon, one of the, uh, one of the very well-trusted sources of Greek um, interpretation in the Christian world. It says that the word fulfill there means to cause God's law to be obeyed as it should be, okay? Now, there are people that believe that there are many different laws, okay? There's the law of Noah, there's the law of Moses, there's the law of Christ. What you need to understand is that just because it's not written down doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, okay? So when I talk about the law of God, I'm not talking about the written law of God. I'm talking about the spoken, the verbal law of God. God said, you know... And there must have been a law that was spoken that was never written. For example, um, you know, many of you have the idea that the the idea of uh, of uh, the law of Moses is is got the law has got a lot to do with sacrifices. Okay, so that the law of sacrifice and the sacrificial system began with the law of Moses. That God spoke to Moses and said, "You shall sacrifice." These are the kind of animals you're supposed to sacrifice, and this is how you're supposed to sacrifice it. You know, and these are the kind of animals that are clean. These are the kind of animals that are unclean. Okay, so if you were to go by the, just the written law, you'd say, "Yeah, we don't really have any proof that it was actually written until Moses wrote it, but we do have proof that it existed and that men and women knew about it back." way back before Moses was born. For example, Abel, he brought the firstlings of the, 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 the lambs, okay? How did he know to sacrifice? How did he know to sacrifice at all? How did he know what to sacrifice? How did he know to sacrifice a lamb? How did he know to sacrifice the firstborn of the lamb? You know, and the same thing, the same thing with Cain. He brought, it says, he didn't bring the first fruits of the, of the, of the field, but he just brought any old, grain offering, whatever it was. But how did he know what to do? Obviously, there was a law in effect, okay? And the reason why Abel's sacrifice was, was accepted and Cain's not because Abel was sacrificed according to the Torah, the unwritten, the verbal Torah, the oral Torah, I guess you might call it, because Abel sacrificed exactly how Moses said to sacrifice, whereas Cain didn't sacrifice exactly how Moses said to sacrifice. Now, I know this is hundreds of years before Moses was born, but you see what I mean? You got to think about this now. Abraham sacrificed to God. 
Isaac, Jacob's sacrifice to God. How did they know to sacrifice? How did they know what to sacrifice? They could have sacrificed anything, a bug. I mean, how did they know exactly what to sacrifice? Because the law of God existed. How did Noah know? It says that, you know, that, that he, it was the unclean animals and the clean animals. That there were seven of the clean and two of the unclean animals. And, he, and afterward, he built an offer and he performed sacrifices. How did he know what was clean and unclean? How did he know what to sacrifice? Because the Torah existed. It was the same Torah, the same law, because it's the same God. Now, a lot of people say, well, the law of Christ is different. No, it's not. Jesus is the Word manifest in the flesh. He is the Word that became flesh. He is, the, more or less, He is the Torah, the law of God personified. Everything in the law speaks of Jesus. Everything in the law is what Jesus obeyed, and Jesus came perfectly in line with the law. Most Christians would say that they want to be like Jesus. If you want to be like Jesus, open the books of Moses and obey. That's what Jesus did, okay? And by the way, it's not hard. It says in, at the very end, God made it very clear in, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, you know, these commandments that I give to you, they're not hard. He's, you know, I mean, God is a, a loving God. He's a God of forgiveness. He's a God of mercy. He's not a God that would deliver his people out of the bondage of Egypt just to slap another bondage on them, a worse bondage on them. No. He's a God of freedom. And that's what it also talks about in the Old Testament, the law of liberty, the law of freedom, okay? So yes, the law of God is one. There are not, there, it's not divided because God is not divided. He's not a schizophrenic. He does not have, he does not have multiple personalities. He does not have associative disorders, personality disorders. He is forever eternal. So his law is forever eternal. The law of Moses is the law of Noah, which is the law of Abraham, which is the law of Christ. It's all the same thing. Just because Adam or Abel didn't write down the same law that Moses wrote down doesn't mean it's not the same law. Of course, they follow the same law. They follow the same God. Jesus existed way before he was born. Okay, so Jesus, Yeshua, is the personification of the law. How did Abel know to sacrifice a lamb? Because he knew the Lord, and he knew it was all about the lamb, okay? So, yes, the law of God is one. It is timeless. Never does it end. It is eternal. And the law of Christ is the law of God. He didn't change. He didn't. Everything that Jesus taught was Torah. Everything. Even when he said, I give you a new commandment, it wasn't a brand new commandment. Just like it, you know, it's the same word for new covenant. It's not a brand new covenant. It's refreshed, re, re, revitalized, refurbished, as it were, or um, renewed, okay? Jesus said, I give you a new covenant that you love. Well, you know, if you know the Torah, you know that the Torah is all, it talks about loving all the way through the Torah, loving your neighbor, treating your enemies well. If you see your enemy that's burdened, you go and help them. That's what the Torah says. It's all about loving your enemies and loving your neighbor, doing unto others as you would have them do to you. That's what the Torah is about. Jesus taught that. Jesus brought nothing new. Even though he said this is a new command, it doesn't mean brand spanking new. It means I'm renewing this to your mind. I'm renewing this. Okay? So, yes, God's law is, is, is eternal. It is forever. It never changes. And it's one law for all ages, for all people who would believe. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like this video. Don't forget to check out my blog at ChristopherEnoch.org. Blessings.